Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hope everybody had a uh, great night after Dr. Satino's opening keynote. I'm Jeremy Collins, the Senior Director of Programs at the Museum's Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, and it'll be my pleasure to serve as the MC throughout today and tomorrow. Though there is no theme specifically for this conference, you will find that many of our sessions are tied in together and do focus on the last 12 months of the war. And I think Rob did a great job of setting us up for that. And this first panel will certainly carry that theme, unofficial theme, through. It will focus on the conventional means of warfare that America and her allies tried to achieve victory in the Pacific through. On the panel, we have three experts of the Asia Pacific Theater. And it's my pleasure to briefly introduce them now. John Kuhn, who is sitting in the middle, is Professor of Military History at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. He served in the U.S. Navy for 23 years and retired with the rank of commander. He's the author of many books, including his latest, Strategy and Crisis, The War in the Pacific. To John's left is James Scott who many of you are familiar with, having come to the conference and or traveled with us overseas. He is the author of many books, three of which are on World War II, The War Below, Target Tokyo, and Black Snow. And chairing this session is my friend, John Parshall. John is the leading expert on the Imperial Japanese Navy, at least English-speaking expert. Well, he is the author of Shattered Sword on the Battle of Midway and on a forthcoming and much anticipated book on the war in 1942. So without further ado, here's our chair, John Parshall. Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning to our online, and, uh, online audience as well. Uh, we wanted to kick off proceedings this morning with a discussion around what I think is one of the most fascinating and also terrible portions of uh, the Second World War with the capture of the Marianas Islands in August of 1944. The United States had achieved one of the, the core uh, tenets of its war strategy in the Pacific, namely grabbing a chunk of real estate that was proximate enough to the Japanese home islands that we could begin the process of either blockading them into submission or bombing them into ruin preparatory to a potential invasion. And it was hoped, of course, that these two operations, which we might think of today as being sort of shaping the battlefield, might be sufficient in their own rights to uh, come, come to the capitulation of, of the Japanese empire, but it was obviously not known. And so to discuss those uh, with me, of course, uh, John Kuhn, who's the only naval aviator at uh, the Army <laughs> Staff College and a longtime friend, and then my co-historian, James Scott, who's been with me on several trips in the Pacific. And John, you're first up. I have my mighty stopwatch of doom. So we will kick things off. Thank you, John. Yes, sir. Appreciate that. Let's see if we can make this work. Um, <laughs> Oh, okay, they can see it down the front? Okay, all right. So uh, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, good morning, we'll get right to it because he's got me on the stopwatch, so I've gotta, I gotta move out smartly here. Um, uh, I picked this picture because it kind of captures sort of uh, some of the nuance and the sort of some of the less than nuanced sort of end game in the, in the World War II in the Asia Pacific region, the last year of the war. Let's see if I can make this advance. Yeah. Um, before I start, I, I had a slide up there, it might appear later, uh, and it's this idea uh, that uh, I work for the Army. So, so these are my personal opinions. They don't belong to the Department of the Army, the Department of the Navy, the Department of Defense, or the federal government, just to make sure we get that out there. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Japanese culture, shall we? Um, Japanese decision making is, is really an alien thing to most Westerners. Um, and for World War II, the Japanese decision-making piece was centered on this idea of kokutai. And if you're ever wondering what the Japanese goals become as the war sort of progressively worsens and, and J Japan is faced with military defeats 
uh, at almost at all points of the compass, it becomes this idea that they're going to preserve the Kokutai. Well, what is the Kokutai? Kokutai is the national spirit. It's embodied not just by the emperor and his family, but by the imperial relics and by the overall kami, or spirit, of the Japanese people. Uh, the physical manifestations are the emperor and the imperial relics. And so the idea is we have to maintain the Kokutai. So the Japanese admirals and the Japanese generals, uh, this is their goal, is to prevent the Kokutai from going away. And, and, they're, and they're worried that the Allies' uh, 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 unconditional surrender, and, and then later enumerated at Potsdam Declaration, conditions will remove the Kokutai from Japan, and that will destroy Japan spiritually and culturally. So, I mean, this is absolutely uh, critical to understanding why they make the decisions they do, uh, which seem to us in the West as intransigent. So let's, and that's what drives our goals for this. Well, here's the laydown. So at the top is the emperor, but the emperor rarely makes a decision. He's the head of the Supreme Council for the Direction of the War. Not that many meetings by this council once the war begins in 1937 in China, but his main executive body for decision making is the Supreme Military Council. Um, something that's fascinating about this slide is, does anybody see the prime minister here? <laughs> well, of course, Tojo is the war minister. He's the prime minister. But if the prime minister had been a civilian, he would not have fit into the strategic decision making of the Supreme Council for the direction of the war. Also note the board of admirals, of uh, marshals and admirals. These are the genro. So these are the, you know, the great heroes from, from previous uh, engagements, wars. They're not active duty anymore, but they're still a major collective voice. And so any decision making about Japan accepting the Potsdam Declaration or accepting or beginning even negotiations is going to also have to go through him, them. So this is a form of consensus decision making that's somewhat alien to us in the United States. And, uh, uh, and the emperor's piece of this is to either agree or disagree. And oftentimes, the emperor won't do anything. He'll just kind of sit there, and people will kind of have to guess whether or not they got a consensus on a decision. So it's a very, so the reason I'm going into detail about this is we're trying to get the Japanese to negotiate and, and trying to get the Japanese to come through the Soviets and say, hey, we're, we're ready to talk, we're ready to, uh, we're ready to surrender. But getting that decision from the Japanese just becomes more and more difficult as the last year of the war grinds on. And this is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but the decision-making machinery in Tokyo is part of that. Well, there's the Suzuki cabinet. This is going to be the cabinet that's in place at the end of the war. Admiral Suzuki is actually the uh, second prime minister after Tojo resigns. After, uh, after the defeat in the Marianas, Tojo is the prime minister, and he resigns. Uh, so, so, uh, so this is, he's actually the second guy after that. There was an interim prime minister whose name I can't recall right now. And he's, a, he's an admiral. Suzuki is an admiral. About half of this cabinet is leaning towards talking. The other half of the cabinet, particularly the war minister, General Anami, are against talking to the allies. And again, one man, it's sort of a one-man veto here. So anybody can sort of veto things. So how do you get to this? How do you get these guys to surrender? How do you get them to lay down their arms? Well, there's two ways. So now we're going to switch hats. Okay, we're going to go from Japanese decision-making, culture, difficulty, constraint, and we're going to go to this idea of American allied coalition strategy. And it really is a coalition strategy. It's agreed you know, at all these various conferences from Casablanca to Tehran to Yalta to Potsdam that uh, Japan is basically going to get the same deal as Germany, unconditional surrender. And the, and, and the terms of that are enumerated in the Potsdam Declaration. It's not quite clear if the Allies are going to leave the emperor in charge. It's kind of fuzzy and vague in the language of the Potsdam Declaration. All right? And so the Japanese are kind of left wondering, well, will Kokutai survive if we accept the Potsdam Declaration? So there's two ways to do this. The first way is something called the Strangle Plan. That's the original way. Uh, initially, uh, right after World War I, uh, Harry Yarnell with, uh, with uh, uh, William Pye and H.H. H. Frost uh, wrote an article or wrote a, a monograph that actually examined this, and they said the U.S. Navy, it was impractical for the United States Navy to conduct a blockade of Japan, should that become the case. By 1937, that was no longer impractical. 
By that point, Yarnell was pretty high up, so was Pi in the Navy, and the Strangle Plan essentially becomes the end state for War Plan Orange. We'll defeat the Japanese Navy, establish command of the sea, and then we'll bomb and blockade Japan into submission with economic warfare and starvation. The second way is the way we did it against the Germans. We're going to put boots on the ground in the enemy's capital city. All right? Uh, and the, the first way kind of underwrites the second way. All right? So the first way is a means to kind of get to that second way. It might end the war all on its own, blockade and bombing. There's still a lot of talk about this, and hopefully in questions we can explore it further. But, uh, but General Marshall and the combined chiefs of staff I generally believed that the war in Asia was going to end like the war in Europe ended, with boots on the ground in the Kanto Plain. Notice, the atomic bombs aren't part of the calculus. The first uh, way underwrites the second way. So if you can get command of the sea and start bombing Japan and, and, and blockading Japan, you're going to set it up to make the invasion easier. Now, you know, Everything in war is, you know, is simple, but the, the simplest things are difficult. So, so again, it's, it's, you know, it'll make it easier, but, it's, you know, but we're talking about making a very, very difficult uh, set of invasions, first in Kyushu uh, and then in the Kanto Plain. Those invasions will still be incredibly difficult. Nobody underestimated what those invasions might cost. So the means to do that uh, first piece uh, once we have sort of general command of the sea in the Western Pacific, and this pretty much occurs after the Battle of Lady Gulf, somewhere between the battles of the Philippine Sea and the Battle of Lady Gulf, the United States Navy becomes, uh, it has sort of the naval equivalent of air superiority. They can kind of go and do whatever they want, all right? Yeah, there's a little problem around Okinawa with kamikazes. They have to deal with that. It gives them a preview of how dangerous it's going to be once they get in close to Japan. But uh, the main target uh, in these last years of the war, the last 18 months of the years of the war, is Japanese economy. Uh, and uh, the naval means to do this are submarines, naval de delivered mines in the air with naval aviation, not just on carriers, but mo on uh, land-based uh, air, because the Navy uh, is finally given the ability to use land-based air uh, during the war. And then, of course, surface fires. And I'm going to go through this at light speed. So here are the numbers for the submarines. Now, these come from Admiral King's reports to the Secretary of the Navy. And GWT is gross weight tonnage. As you'll notice, you know, the submarine campaign kind of gets a flat start, all right? Uh, the total tonnage there, you know, is almost like the, uh, a monthly tonnage total for the U-boat war. And some of the, some of the months for the U-boat war are in World War I. It's, it's very underwhelming in 1942. Uh, 580,000 tons is not much when the Japanese have something between 7 and 8 million tons of shipping. But by 1943, the numbers begin to go up. We sort of all know why. It had to do with doctrine, it had to do with leadership, and it had to do with fixing broken torpedoes, all right? But once all those things come together, the numbers go way up. And, uh, uh, and, and by 1944, the U.S. submarine and allied submarine force, because remember there's British and Dutch submarines involved as well, uh, sink their greatest totals, okay? By the time we get to 1945, this goes down, all right? This goes down. Why so few in the last eight months of the war? Why, why, why do they go down? One of the reasons, fewer targets, okay? Another reason is, is you're starting to sink more and more ships in the littoral areas, which are difficult for submarines with airplanes, mm. not just uh, Navy airplanes, but Army airplanes and Marine airplanes. Okay. There's naval aviation doing some sinking there. Uh, the sinkings that had occurred in the island campaigns, but after the, the, the capture of the Philippines, uh, the sinkings by airplanes, both Navy, Army, and Marine, go way, way up, all right, as you can see here. Uh, total carrier-based uh, sinkings uh, for Japanese merchant shipping is pretty healthy. 16% uh, sunk by just carrier-based air alone. Land-based aviation will throw in another uh, 500. Surface is the worst. You know, you can sink ships with other ships. The United States doesn't develop a policy of raiders like the Germans do with these highly successful merchant ship raiders. And actually, the, the United States surface forces don't sink any more than the Japanese lost to accidents alone. Mm -hmm. It's a rather startling, startling number there. But it shows you it's really the long-range platforms, submarines and air, that are sinking everything. 
Okay, so hypothesis or thesis, this is sort of my dry academic way of saying most of the maritime tra traffic uh, that's being eliminated that's key to the Japanese supply chains and infrastructure in the last war is, in the last year of the war is being sunk by airplanes and mines. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, more about mines, but submarine-delivered mines, but mostly air-delivered mines, okay? So, you've, so you're sinking a lot of things, and this is critical to sort of breaking Japan's uh, economy. The numbers for this come from the Strategic Bombing Survey Far East. It was put together by guys like Paul Nitsa and John Kenneth Galbraith. And, uh, and so, uh, so uh, this, is, this is causing immense difficulties in Japan. And, and the Japanese know it. So all those guys that are, that are in the Supreme Council for the direction of the war, they, they see things. However, they're ready to go all the way uh, to uh, 60 million men, women, and child. They're ready to die to the last man, woman, and child in Japan. So it's having an effect, but it's sort of like boiling the frog in water, right? The frog refuses to jump out of the water. So this is a very, very su successful economic warfare campaign, but it does not bring resolution all on its own. Um, so, you know, we all know about the atomic bombs and their role. Uh, when I sort of thought about, you know, the, the stuff that kind of got the Japanese to make the decision, it wasn't just the bombs. Uh, it, was, it was the bombs, it was the Soviets, uh, it, was, it was the threat of using nuclear weapons in the invasion, it was the threat of using weapons of mass destruction like gas in the invasion, there's the Soviets. Um, but I thought about it, I wonder how many ships, you know, were destroyed when we dropped that bomb on Nagasaki, you know, so we, was, you know, it, at the very least we were still strangling the Japanese economy and it continued to strangle because we had destroyed those infrastructures and supply chains uh, so effectively in the last year of the war. But uh, this sort of miracle that occurs at the end of the war with the confluence of all of these sort of shocks eventually convinces the emperor that he's got one decision to make and he makes it and he accepts the Potsdam Declaration. Although his advisors take over a week to write the imperial rescript to make sure the language is just right and doesn't include the word surrender. And I look forward to your questions. I know I kind of blew through the numbers there, but we can revisit those if you want during the question period. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did I run over? Yeah, that's all good. Good morning. So I hope everybody is doing well, bright and early. Mm -hmm. We're queuing up the slides now. John, thank you for the excellent overview of the Japanese policy and, of course, the Navy's efforts to strangle the homeland. I'm going to jump in this morning and tackle the contribution of the Army Air Forces. And as you will see, the efforts of the Army and the Navy functioned really as a one-two punch uh, to the Japanese in that last year of the war. For the Air Service, there were two components to that mission. The first was the aerial mining campaign known as Operation Starvation. In the second, there was the firebombing campaign that ultimately destroyed more than 170 uh, squ uh, square miles of Japan's cities. And these operations ran concurrently in 1945. Now to start, however, I want to back up to November 1944 when the Army Air Forces began its first bombing missions against the Japanese homeland from the Mariana Islands. Now the capture of the Mariana Islands of Saipan, Tinian, and Guam in the summer of 1944 put the Japanese, Japan's major cities for the first time in range of American bombers. And we aren't just talking about any bombers. These were, of course, the brand new B-29 Super Fortresses, Boeing's aeronautical monster. With a tail that rose as high as a three-story building, the Super Fortress boasted the largest propellers ever put on an airplane with a sprawling 141-foot wingspan. That's 20 feet longer than the Wright brothers' first flight. <laughs> These bombers had cost taxpayers a staggering $3.7 billion, making the B-29 the single most expensive weapon system of the war, costing almost twice as much, in fact, as the atomic bomb. Now, these early missions were commanded by Brigadier General Haywood Hansel, who had served as one of the principal architects of America's air war against Germany. Hansel had helped develop the concept of high-altitude daylight precision bombing, a strategy we used in Europe, which he viewed as morally superior to the firebombing of cities, like what the British were doing throughout the European campaign. The problem, as Hansel soon discovered, however, was that unlike Germany, impenetrable clouds often blanketed the island nation of Japan, limiting visibility some months to as little as just three days. 
In addition, crews battled hellacious jet streams over the Japanese empire that raged at speeds of up to 230 miles per hour and wrecked bombing accuracy. Hansel's early missions were designed to knock out Japan's aircraft industry in order to gain superiority of the air, but his post-strike photos revealed that his pilots were lucky to hit within 1,000 feet of the target, much less destroy it. By the end of 1944, despite having flown eight missions against Tokyo and Nagoya, Hansel had failed to destroy a single factory. Japan's war machine still hummed. General Hap Arnold, who was commander of the Army Air Forces, fired Hansel in January of 1945, and he replaced him with Major General Curtis LeMay, who at the time was just 38 years old. <laughs> LeMay was an, a pragmatist. He was also an engineer by training and a problem solver. And like Hansel, LeMay initially adhered to America's strategy of daylight, high-altitude precision bombing. And like his predecessor, he struggled with Japan's terrible cloud cover and its ferocious jet streams, which combined to stymie his attacks. As those days turned to weeks and America's bombing results failed to improve, LeMay sensed that the buzzards were circling. Something had to change, and fast. And with this in mind, LeMay made what proved to be one of the most consequential decisions of the war. He would abandon America's strategy of daylight high altitude precision bombing and instead firebomb Japanese cities at night. And for his first major raid, he set his sights on Tokyo. The March 9, uh, 1945 raid devoured an astonishing 15.8 square miles of the enemy's capital reducing the heart of Tokyo to an apocalyptic wasteland of smoldering ruins, interrupted only by the occasional brick chimney of a torched bathhouse or factory, like you can see here. The inferno claimed the lives of 105,000 men, women, and children. That sum is more than four times the number killed in the firebombing of Dresden, and more even than those who initially had died in the atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The strike wounded more than 40,000 others and left one million people homeless. Literally one out of every four buildings in Tokyo vanished. The lack of any public backlash for that raid served as a green light for LeMay, who, anxious to capitalize on success before Japan adapted to these tactics, went on and ordered his bombers to immediately hit Nagoya, Osaka, Kobe, and Nagoya again. In five missions flown over a span of less than 10 days, LeMay's bombers scorched a staggering 32 square miles of uh, four of Japan's largest cities. At about the same time, LeMay was ordered to participate in Operation Starvation, which was the Navy's efforts to um, mine the Empire's waters. These efforts were designed to support the submarine blockade that John just talked about and further cut off imports of vital war materials. LeMay was initially reluctant to tackle this operation because he did not want to do anything that would distract from his strategic bombing, but he later acknowledged the operation's great success. Over more than 1,500 sorties, LeMay's B-29s planted more than 12,000 mines in the waters of Japan, China, and Korea. Those undersea weapons sank 294 ships and knocked another 137 out of the war. 239 other Japanese ships ended up in repair yards. That averaged out to five ships sunk or damaged every day from March to the end of the war. So you can see it had a real tremendous impact on the Japanese. With his mining operation underway, LeMay shifted his focus back to firebombing Japan's cities. The 32 square miles his bombers destroyed in March more than tripled by June. His bombers burned 102 square miles out of Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Yokohama, Kobe, and Kawasaki. With Japan's six major industrial cities largely in ruins, American forces turned their attention to secondary and even tertiary sized cities. The tempo of attacks likewise increased as more bombers and crews arrived each month in the Marianas. As a result, literally one out of every three Japanese people would personally experience these raids, and while one out of five would suffer the loss of property. Quote, air raids, as one post-war report concluded, brought the war home psychologically as well as physically to the Japanese people. So what was the impact like in Japan? Outside of a few industries like fish oil and sulfur, Japan had almost no material self-sufficiency, forced to import even its most basic food source, rice. The blockade only exacerbated those challenges, slashing vital imports of oil, rubber, metals, and food. Government scrap drives, which collected everything from temple bells to home hibachis, failed to keep up. 
The loss of oil, of course, proved to be one of the biggest calamities, forcing engineers to scrounge for substitutes, including a failed attempt to make gasoline from shale and sardines. But few such desperate measures helped. The loss of fuel, in fact, would in the end spark the creation of the nation's kamikaze corps, which made its first combat appearance during the Battle of Leyte Gulf in the Philippines. The impact of the blockade reverberated on the home front as well, where the average caloric intake in the last year of the war dropped down to about 1,600 calories. The infant mortality rate climbed, while new mothers often proved too malnourished to produce milk, forcing hospitals to bottle feed newborns radish and turnip juices, both rich in vitamin C. Older children suffered rickets, which is a disease sparked by prolonged vitamin D deficiency that causes soft and deformed bones. Added to the hunger and exhaustion was the nightly threat of bombings. Across Japan, more than eight and a half million people fled to the countryside. Roughly one-fourth of the nation's entire urban population fled. That inundation of people into the country's, country's rural areas, of course, created added hardships and frictions. Quote, the food problems were the chief cause of this, one schoolmaster testified after the war. There simply wasn't enough for everyone. Those who chose to remain in the cities often suffered post-traumatic stress as the attacks continued. And an estimated 237,000 people ultimately settled in the scorched ruins of Tokyo, hoping that American bombers would not target those hard-hit areas again. Similar stories played out in other major cities like Osaka and Yokohama. And life in the ruins was hard as men, women, and children bedded down in shanties made from salvaged uh, metal without electricity or water. Garbage and waste littered the air and the, which, over which hung the smell of human excrement. Every day I burned scraps of wood taken from destroyed houses to cook my meals, writer and playwright Kafunagai wrote in his diary. Life in a defeated country, no water, no fire, one can fairly say that we have reached the extreme of misery. LeMay's campaign culminated on the morning of August 6th. And the atomic attack on Hiroshima followed 73 hours later by the atomic attack on Nagasaki. Only then, with dozens of its cities in ruin, did the Japanese government finally surrender. In the 159 days from his strike on Tokyo until Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's intention to surrender, LeMay scorched, uh, torched 66 Japanese cities for a total of 178 square miles. Tokyo suffered the worst. Over multiple attacks, airmen burned 56 square miles of the capital. To put that in perspective, that's almost three times the size of Manhattan Island. All told, America's bombing campaign against the Japanese homeland killed more than 330,000 people, injured nearly a half million others, and left eight and a half million people homeless. But truthfully, it was the combination of the air attacks and the sea blockade that crippled Japan's economy. Quote, Japan's economy one post-war report concluded, was in large measure being destroyed twice over, once by cutting off imports and secondly by the air attack. Thank you very much. Nice job. Cool. Yeah. A lot to try to pack in. Photo, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, as uh, in my, my August position as, as chair, I get to kick off the, the first questions. And, Actually, I wanted to ask you, John, um, you know, you had the one slide there with uh, the, the sort of the org chart uh, of the empire, and you commented about how it was extremely militariocentric, if you will. How do we actually then get to the big six, where we have uh, Suzuki, the prime minister, and also the foreign minister, Togo, are inserted in, into the process as well? Any, any comments on that? Uh, again, it's, you know, it's consensus decision making um, and uh, there's, a, there's a key guy who's sort of the guy in the wings, it's the Marquis Quito. Right. And, and he sort of, he, he's sort of the guy who translates the emperor's pleasure or displeasure and of course for the last year of the war it's mostly displeasure. <laughs> um, it's why Tojo has to resign, it's why his successor has to resign, and that's why Suzuki himself is, is also in danger. And, and Suzuki had been very pro-war at the beginning of the war, but those six guys that you're talking, the war minister, the navy minister, the chief of the navy general staff, the chief of the army general staff, um, uh, the, the prime minister, the, the convincing those guys, we get to the point where it's five to one, all right? 
Now, now some of them are like agreeing to accept Potsdam under, under duress. But, you know, the dynamic of the emperor agreeing here is, is absolutely constrained by the formality of, of, of the pro forma stuff that has to take place around the emperor. Um, you know, whenever the emperor communicates, he's a god speaking. So that's why Quito has sort of got a channel for the emperor. And so during these last period of the war, it's, it's, it's uh, particularly the last month. Uh, from, from early July until we get to, to August 8, 9, and 10. It's, um, it's, they're slowly coming over to the peace party side. Um, but it, it's a very militarist organization. They don't want to be the ones that will be responsible for the posterity of Japan for eliminating the national kokutai. And so Anami is the last holdout. Right. And uh, so, so the way to get to these guys is via military means. The, fi the firebombings are what we would call at the Army Command and General Staff College enabling operations, okay? <laughs> they can see the destruction. However, these guys are dead enders. I mean, they're hardcore. They've got thousands of gallons of aviation gasoline stored away in the mountains of Kyushu. They've got 7,000 aircraft ready to go for kamikaze operations. They have carefully conserved pilots uh, to both be pathfinders, these are the guys that don't have to kill themselves, as well as to take off and go hit American ships. So they're not convinced that this is worth it. They actually try to kidnap the emperor right. and move him up to uh, Nikko, to the command center at Nikko. They take one of the imperial relics, I think it's uh, the sword. No, the sword gets dropped in, in, in a straight earlier. It's, but it's one of the relics. They, they actually move one of the relics up to Nikko and they think the emperor will follow it up there. And he goes, no, I'm staying here. And, and their, their argument is, they're firebombing your hometown, Hirohito. You know, you, you could go up in smoke and flames. We need to protect you and put you in a cave up in Nikko in the Japanese Alps there. Yeah, except that he recognizes, of course, that that now places me directly under the army's control. And I right, can, yeah. and, and, and he's got brothers, okay? So, and, and Rich Frank has gone into this, but Hirohito's also worried the complete structure of the state is gonna co collapse. Right. You can push the Japanese people only so far, and then you get anarchy, and then who's gonna surrender? Right. Who's gonna surrender those 1.9 million Japanese troops in China who really haven't been defeated yet? Who's gonna, although the Soviets are gonna do a lot of work on that, that's gonna help. Yeah. But uh, so, so what does it is the bombs. And it's not the first bomb, it's the second bomb. Right. The second bomb proves to the Japanese that not only the Americans can do a one-off with this horrible new weapon, which they don't know what it is, they just know it vaporizes cities, but it vaporizes, and so if you can vaporize cities, you can vaporize the beach defenses in Kyushu. Right. And that's what convinces Anami, our military plan to force the Americans to have so many casualties, you know, a half a million casualties in Kyushu, millions of casualties in, in Honshu, it's bankrupt. Okay. Anami does not say, I agree to Potsdam. He just says, I agree to just not decide and go with the, but he never says yes. Right. He goes home and he prepares his suicide and kills himself. Right. <laughs> and good riddance. And good riddance. Good riddance. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, he saved us the trouble, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> For James, I, I just was, I was wondering, um, LeMay was not enthusiastic about Operation Starvation to begin with. Yeah. Were there... Uh, was there oppos opposition to that operation on the Joint Chiefs such that there had to be wrangling between the Joint Chiefs, or did Nimitz just basically walk in to LeMay's office virtually as theater commander and say, you're going to do this? How did that all work? No, when they set up the 20th Air Force, the caveat all along was, of course, when Hap Arnold really wanted his own independent air service, and of course when the B-29 is about to come online, it's this revolutionary new bomber. Uh, he did not want it to be used as a tactical bomber. He was afraid that it would be absorbed by MacArthur or by Nimitz and it would just be an auxiliary to either the Army or the Navy. He very much saw this as an independent warfighting platform to do exactly what LeMay did with it. And so in order to prevent that, uh, having such dominant personalities in the Pacific, he came up with the idea to create the 20th Air Force. Uh, and he would actually run that Air Force himself out of Washington. And so he pitched that idea to the Joint Chiefs of Staff they greenlit that, so he technically was the commander of it, and then his subordinate, first Hansel, and then LeMay would be the ones to execute that operation. In order to sort of get the approval 
uh, in, of the other Joint Chiefs for this sort of very unorthodox setup, he had to agree that when necessary, they, the B-29s would be diverted to help out. And so it wasn't just Operation Starvation. They also uh, targeted a lot of airfields and things like that in advance of, uh, of Okinawa and whatnot. Uh, and so, you know, LeMay periodically had to do that, and, and he did it begrudgingly. I think with Operation Starvation, however, he very much came around to the idea of realizing the value of it and later wrote in his memoir, hey, this actually turned out to be a really good thing. By this point, too, he's getting more and more bombers coming in, and so more and more air crews. So he's able actually just to designate one air wing and say, you guys alone are going to handle Operation Starvation, and I'm going to continue to doing firebombing cities over here, particularly as the air war ramps up in June and July. Of course, at that time, the mining is still going on, the city busting is still going on. Quite frankly, he's really running out of targets, and so he almost has more crews and bombs and things like that than he can do. So instead of hitting one city with 500 or 1,000 bombers a night, he's then spreading them out, and he's going after four or five different cities at a time each night. And so, uh, and of course, Japan's air defenses at that point are virtually nil. They've aggregated all of their fighters and anti-aircraft around a couple major cities, and now he's targeting secondary cities they can't keep up. And so, quite frankly, he really, it, it, it all, I mean, it just becomes just this tidal wave of American air power that's washing over Japan at that point. So, uh, so Operation Starvation, of course, was just one part of Because it only took up, Starvation only consumed about like 5% of LeMay's overall sorties. Is, yeah. that, is that correct? It's not a huge amount, no. Yeah. And it, it, the return on the investment is tremendous. Yeah, big bang. Big Immense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so my, my follow-on question then was going to be to comment about, you know, what was the working relationship like between Nimitz and LeMay, but that sounds like it's basically Actually, they moved. got along well. Oh, yeah, did they? No, uh, I mean, Nimitz was a pretty low-key guy and easy to yeah. get along with, and, and LeMay didn't really, um, I mean, they, he didn't have any real tensions there with him. So. All right. Well, one thing, John, that you, you skated over for the, for the sake of time, but I've always kind of wondered about, of course, um, there were actual surface operations against the Japanese mainland. You know, at one point in time, we sailed a battleship force up the coast and, you know, shelled the, the Kamaishi ironworks or something like that. I've always uh, thought to myself that the actual practical effect of those bombardments was relatively minor, and it was really more a PR stunt than anything else, a morale breaker for the, for the Japanese. But do you have any... Well, certainly the authors of the uh, strategic bombing survey for the Far East, uh, they just looked at the numbers and the numbers didn't seem significant to them. Yeah. I mean, you're getting so much bang for the buck in mining the littorals and, and just destroying, you know, uh, in, that as an infrastructure. I mean, when, when the cities, if you've been to Japan, it's one big mountain. And, and so it's not easy to move around. Anybody who's driven from Tokyo to Atsugi could tell you, it's not easy to get around Japan. And, and even, it was even harder back then. So you have to move things via the waterways. And, and uh, so I agree with John. I think the battleships and surface bombardments, that was more of a, a PR stunt. It was sort of a demonstration, though. Hey, we can sail with impunity off your coasts and bombard your cities, you know. I mean, earlier in the war, you'd had some crazy submarine skippers, fluky, you know, that that left their submarines and blew up trains and yes. stuff like that. And those were more, you know, it was more sort of high profile, daring do, you know, good for the home front, but, but and maybe good for the, the budget, you know, for the, for the service, but in terms of uh, practical effect, uh, you know, relatively minor, relatively. Was, uh, from a risk assessment standpoint, pro probably a little risky, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a little too risky, you yeah. know, because that's a, that's a big investment, a, a battleship, and it takes a it's easy to sink a battleship with a mine. Just ask the Russians. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. I'd actually like to turn it over to, uh, to the audience at this point and get some Q&A going. I'm sort of springing that on, on Jeremy. I see him pacing now. He's like, thanks, Partial. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah. It's too early. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank you, John, and thank you, James, for a wonderful start to our morning. <laughs> We're going to start to your left about halfway back. Um, just to kind of build off of what uh, John presented, was there actually like a surface naval strategy implemented besides the PR stunts and the uh, submarine skippers to actually like station off of the harbors and start picking off the merchant ships or to shell harbor facilities? Or was it just straight PR stunts? There was no actual naval strategy to it? Well, that's, a, that's an area that, that I think is ripe for research. Uh, but part of, the, part of what's going on here is 
there's a lot of sort of audibles being called, to use a football, football metaphor, you know, there's a, it's a lot, of, a lot of operations, a lot of good ideas are coming up, because now all of a sudden you've got all of these capabilities, but we forget about the impact of iceberg, of the invasion of Okinawa. I mean, the, the U.S. fleet is very much tied up by Okinawa. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, you know, yeah, people are thinking about doing this, but as long as you've got this unsolved problem with Ketsugo during, Ketsugo is a kamikaze campaign during, during, uh, during Iceberg, um, the, the fleet is really having difficulties. You've got so many damaged warships. Yeah, there are undamaged warships. You can send a battleship up there. Uh, the Navy hadn't really looked at using surface ships as sort of an economic component. Their idea of the, of the blockade was that, you know, that they would go after, that they would do sort of a, an open, uh, far or distant blockade and sort of cut the Japanese resources. They, I think they thought in the interwar period surface ships might play a bigger role in interdicting that. But when we get into, you know, the end game here where we're really in the western, western Pacific, close to the Japanese islands, uh, I, I don't think there was a lot of effort going into it. I mean, there were, there were plans and operations underway. Because, uh, quite frankly, the end of the war took everybody by surprise. It, it really did. I, I, I think the, the end of World War II in the Pacific was, I, the way it ended and the way it ended so quickly, I, I think it kind of surprised everybody. I don't think they thought it was going to go that way. I've called it a succession of, of things that leads to sort of a miracle. I have an art, uh, a brief on that that I used to give. But it takes everybody by surprise. So there are plans, but I don't know how, how mature they are. Uh, you've only got about, what, after Okinawa's over, you're, you're, and most of the planning is going into the invasion, too. You have to remember, most of the naval planning is going into Olympic and Coronet. Olympic is for the invasion of Kyushu, and Coronet is the invasion of Honshu. And, and we might hear some more on this from Dennis John Greco later in the conference. Yep. So that's my take. But hey, it's open for research. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go in the back to your left, please. General, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I was impressed with the staggering number of naval mines used in the process. What, what became of that legacy, and who dealt with those naval mines? <laughs> yeah, so actually, I'll jump in, and I'll let you jump in, too. Um, one of the places that we go to on the Japan tour that the museum runs, we go down to Kure, to first the Kure Maritime Museum, and then right across the street, there is a museum to the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Forces. And the, the bulk of the exhibits in there are talking about their post-war development of mine clearing capabilities. <laughs> because, of course, their harbors at this point were just absolutely festooned with mines. And to this day, the JMSDF is extremely proficient in mine clearing. And it all comes about as a result of their post-war experience uh, developing that capability just to be able to clear their harbors out so that they could resume first intra-island uh, commerce and then wider commerce as well. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is actually during the war, uh, they were so desperate to be able to break through there that they used suicide boats just to be able to clear in order to keep commerce coming and going So uh, before the end of the war. Yeah, it just it absolutely shut them down. Yeah. It's amazing. All the way in the back to the far left with Connie. A couple of years ago, um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a quite popular book about this whole subject, so I'm curious what any of you guys think about his treatment of it. And if I remember correctly, he portrays Haywood Hansel as this somewhat noble but tragic figure. So I'm curious what you think of that interpretation of things. I couldn't hear the question. He, Hansel is a noble and tragic oh. figure, but oh, I don't okay. know who the author is. Who's the author you were mentioning? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, look, Hansel is actually, um, uh, I think a very fascinating individual. Um, he was a huge believer. He was a he was a very gentle human being. He um, he was a father. He had uh, uh, several children. He was a big uh, Shakespeare lover. Um, he wrote poetry. Um, he was just a gentle soul. And he I think the idea of burning cities and moving to total war was something that very much bothered him. And uh, and. And quite frankly, his firing by Half Arnold it was, was a huge blow that, that impacted him for the rest of his life. And if you go and you spend time looking at his papers, which are out at the Air Force Academy uh, library there, you see 
as he's writing, because he spends a lot of his post-war career looking back and writing. He wrote several books on air power. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had, he carried on extensive correspondence with others like Ira Eaker, who he was friends with, uh, other senior air leaders. Uh, and, and that resentment sort of stayed with him for the rest of his life. He, he never forgave Hap Arnold for that. Uh, now, what's interesting, however, is LeMay, his successor, and had actually been his subordinate in the European theater. Yeah. In fact, if you go through LeMay's personnel file, you will find that it was Hansel that re recommended him to be promoted to Brigadier General. It was Hansel that had commendations done for him for his work, for LeMay's work in the European theater. Uh, but when LeMay takes over for him in, the, in Guam, LeMay actually outranks him at that point by a star. And Hansel never held that against LeMay. In fact, he was asked after the war who were some of the great um, leaders of the war, and he actually singled out Curtis LeMay for his campaign against Japan, and, uh, and, and particularly sort of the firebombing, and being that it was LeMay's decision, he alone made it, uh, and that he should be commended for that. Hansel did not, he kind of wavered if you look at his writings later on. I mean, sometimes he would say, yes, it worked, and other times he would say, I still think we could have won through uh, high altitude precision bombing, but the fact of the matter is, time was not on his side. Uh, the American public was not gonna wait for years for us to figure this out and to be able to bomb Japan into submission that way. The pressure was on for us to hurry up and end this war. And had it not been Hansel and, or LeMay, it would have been somebody else that would have come in and taken that. But Hansel is a, uh, I find him to be a, a very fascinating individual, uh, just like I find LeMay to be that way as well. I was just gonna comment in the, you know, the context of this 1942 book that I've been working on for a quarter of my lifetime. Um, <laughs> you know, sort of, sort of the mental image that you have in that year that I have is of a, of a man on a ladder climbing down with one foot on one rung and the other is already sunk down. And in, in my mind, the Eighth Air Force comes into that war with all these, I don't wanna say highfalutin, but highfalutin ideals. You know, we're not gonna bomb women and kids. Bomber Command, of course, has already stepped down to the lower rung and yeah. like, no, we're, we're bombing these cities flat. Fast forward, of course, to 1945, and we end the war in the fashion that we end the war, and the bottom line is that we can only be as moral as our bombing technology of the day will allow us to be. Yeah. And given the meteorolog meteorological conditions that pertain over Japan, precision yeah. bombing just isn't gonna work, and we gotta get, get this thing over with. No, we would've been set up to continue a bombing campaign that would've gone on for years. I mean, and so, and there's simply the, the, the domestic pressure to hurry up and end the war, particularly when Germany is out. Uh, I mean, one of the first questions that Truman gets asked at his first press conference in 1945 is, when are you gonna bring horse racing back? <laughs> because it, during the war, it, it was a prohibition on it. I mean, the American public was ready. They wanted to buy cars again. They, you know, they were tired of you know, the, the, the rationing and stuff like that. So there was this huge domestic pressure to return. Just get it over. Uh, yeah. Next question is going to be to your right, about halfway back. Had we not had the bomb, could the blockade and the bombing for Japan to surrender without an invasion? You know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go first, yeah. James. Yeah, and then I'll I'll tag. I mean, you. yeah. I mean, I think I mean, General Marshall had actually raised the question of like, if we burned up Tokyo, 16 square miles, killed 105,000 people, and that did not bring them to the surrender table. Why is this bomb going to be any different? And, uh, and so, I mean, I think there were those concerns. And I think after the bombing of Hiroshima, uh, there, there was, you know, that was a very tense 48-hour period after that when we were looking for signals out of Japan as to what, this was, what response this was going to have. Uh, as John noted earlier, it's the Nagasaki bomb that actually is what gets us right. over that threshold. And, uh, and quite frankly, the smartest decision made was to drop that bomb immediately thereafter because it communicated to the Japanese that, you know, hey, you know, we knew we only had two of them at that point, but they didn't know that. And if we can drop them 73 hours apart from one another, we could drop these things, you know, every three days from here till the end of time. And they just knew at that point the game was up. So um, they were looking for some sort of face-saving way out. I mean, because at that point, you have to remember, Japan's economy is completely destroyed. Their, their society is unraveling. Their people are starving. They're, they're having a huge uh, exodus from the cities. There's not enough food, things like that. They're, they're, they're staring down a potential famine in 1946 because the rice crops are, yeah, are that's... toast. Uh, I mean, they really know they can't hold out. And, uh, and of course, they're looking for some sort of way out. And so the atomic bomb gives them that, gives them that ticket. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, this is one of the things that's documented really well in, in Rich Frank's downfall is the fact that the Japanese railway network is also incredibly important for internal food distribution, and the main trunk lines that run the length of Japan have a, a number of critical tunnels, and we were about to go after that. And the railway network was already sort of on the, on the brink of collapse. If the railways go down, 
food distribution goes down, there's absolutely no way that Japan was gonna come through the, the winter of 45, 46 without massive starvation. So yeah, it was yeah so eventually bad. blockade's gonna work. I mean, it was so bad that by early 45, they were actually yes. taking shipments and saying, all right, instead of bringing in bauxite or rubber or things like that, we're gonna have to bring in food from elsewhere because the Japanese simply, is, as John noted, it's 85% mountainous, okay? They literally, and it's a heavily dense urban population. People were eating dandelions, they were eating acorns, they were eating snakes. Uh, there, you could not find a stray animal anywhere in a major city because yeah. uh, it either starved or been eaten. So they, the food crisis was extreme in Japan at that point. And the Japanese lived a very meager diet at that time compared to the United States. They were not big eat consumers of protein, of eggs, meat, and things like that. Their diets were fish, bean paste, rice, and things like that. So they were used to a trimmer diet, and even then it was having huge health impacts on people in Japan. Yeah, remember, they'd been at war since 1937. Exactly. And so right. there was this slow process of, of, of uh, instituting controls, limitations, rationing that, that had occurred, you know, even before the war had begun in Europe. Yeah. They'd started to implement some of those measures. Yet the, other, the other thing here is when you talk about, you know, would, it, would a blockade and conventional bombing campaign have succeeded, you know, without dropping the atomic bombs. Again, the, I think I've made the point that the key decision makers are, are those six guys. Uh, the, the Russian invasion, uh, one of the holdouts uh, there after June after po and, and after Potsdam is, is the foreign minister. He's still holding out hope that the Soviets are going to broker a peace, even though the Soviets break off diplomatic relations. It's, and so the Soviet invasion, August Storm with the three army groups, forecloses that. That occurs the night before, uh, about 24 hours before Nagasaki happens. And so that, and that actually provides a way out because now there's military defeat in China and you've had a couple of Japanese uh, uh, military generals in the Kwantung army in Manchuria who've been defeated. Uh, now that takes place as the whole you know, acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration after the Nagasaki bomb is taking place, but it, there's ongoing war in Manchuria after the bomb. So World War II doesn't, in Asia, doesn't end with that second bomb on Nagasaki. It, it, it doesn't end for a couple weeks. Uh, there's, there's operations in the Kurils, and, and again, I think John Craig will talk about some of this. Yeah. So that's, that's also part of the problem, but if the real problem is, what if authority collapses in Japan? What if the military kidnaps Hirohito, as John mentioned? Who's going to order all those armies that are between Rangoon and, uh, you know, Hokkaido to surrender? Yeah. You know, and those armies are going to be critical in the post-war period to keep the peace. Yeah. You know, part of the phase four occupation force in Asia after the peace comes is the Japanese army. They turn around and police things until the Dutch, British, French can all come back. Yeah. So it's it's a really yeah a so difficult problem. And I don't I personally I don't believe firebombing and the blockade would have done it. I think they would have made it worse, and you would have seen millions and millions, not just in Japan but in China and Indochina, yes. uh, starve to death. It would have been a catastrophe of just immeasurable proportions, in my opinion. Next question is going to be in the front row to your left, please. I'd like to take us back to the Hansel issue and, and LeMay. There's a historical precedent that where when Cortez was taking over Mexico and they were fighting in Mexico City, <clears throat> the leader of Mexico was the religious leader. And he was hoping they were praying and they were killing people and taking their hearts out and, and, and praying for relief. He had a very good military leader, but he wasn't leading. So Cortez, with very few men, some other Indians from other parts of the state, took over Mexico. The question is, I, I relate Hansel to the guy, the, the, the religious leader, because he was religiously, this idea of, of bombing and the bomber will get through is almost like a religious idea. I mean, they just, they just built. And, and who do you want fighting for you? Do you want Can, a can really you hold the nice mic up guy? to your mouth? I'm sorry, I'm having problems hearing you. Uh, uh, Thanks. You, do you really want a nice guy that, you know, uh, that believes in this re almost relig religious theory? 
or do you want somebody like Curtis May that's, that's grounded in reality? Malcolm Gladwell wrote this very, pretty good book on, on it, air. I, I'm sorry, can, can we just answer that question? I just, I just wanna make sure that we've got time for other questions okay. too. So. Well, I, I, just, I, I just think that it's ridiculous that we would want a man like LeMay. Right. Well, and I'll, I'll jump in on that real quick and say that was one of the biggest complaints about Hansel when Hap Arnold appointed him. Ha Hansel and Arnold had a past history. Hansel had been his chief of staff at the creation of the 20th Air Force. In fact, it was Hansel that helped put in place some of the, uh, the things that sort of paved the way for the creation of the 20th Air Force. Hansel had not been a super dynamic leader in Europe. When he comes back from Europe, he's actually passed over for promotion. A lot of people think his combat career is, at that point is gonna be over. They're stunned when Arnold elevates him to take command of the 21st Bomber Command. Uh, and it's really an issue at that point that comes down, I think, quite frankly, to loyalty. That was an incredibly difficult job to take over. Not only were you pioneering a, a new war, a new campaign there out of the Marianas, you were dealing with base development there, you were dealing with mm -hmm. Japanese snipers, Japanese attacks, uh, you were dealing with a troublesome new airplane, the B-29 was awesome, but its engines tended to catch on fire. Uh, you had crews that were inexperienced flying this new plane, so you had all of these factors, and quite frankly, Hansel was an academic. And I wrote a book about it as well, Black Snow, and in, in it I wrote that he was a planner, not a predator. And LeMay was a predator. And you needed a guy that was an operational combat commander, and that was Kurt LeMay. Yeah. We're gonna get one last question in. Thanks as always. I've always regarded LeMay as the Ulysses Grant of World War II that... He's the Sherman. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I use that analogy as well. He's the Sherman. He's yeah. the city campaign, the burning yeah. campaign. Yep. Very James, a, a question for you. <laughs> Why do you think there was so little reaction to the firebombing of Tokyo, uh, given that they had the reaction in Dresden? Do you think it was a racial component to that? You know, or? I'm going to... So, I'll tell you, I, I, I don't. And I know there's been a lot made out of uh, War Without Mercy by John Dower. And it's a terrific book. But LeMay was never one that... Um, he never viewed anything through the lens of race. He was a spreadsheet guy. Uh, he looked at numbers on a sheet. You know, how many people have you killed? How many cities have you burned? I mean, it was just... It was an analytic, analytical task for him. So race never really played any kind of component with LeMay. Uh, the American public, we were very concerned how the American public would uh, react to this. In fact, the Air Force, right after that uh, March 9th raid, um, was literally scouring editorial pages and looking at the congressional records to see if lawmakers were speaking out, what the press were saying, radio, things like that. Time Magazine, however, pretty much put everybody's fears aside when they wrote, properly kindled, Japan cities will burn like the autumn leaves. Uh, and that pretty much summed up how the American public viewed the firebombing campaign. You got You really got to get into war fatigue, exhaustion. How things are going at this point. Uh, people are tired of the war. They're ready for it to be. In, they're ready for it to end. Uh, you know, Europe's wrapping up. You're going to have a huge redeployment of troops. You know, either back to the states or back overseas. You know, there is a real effort to just sort of hurry up and get it over with. And I think that's probably the underlying thing more than anything else. Um, also, I do think Pearl Harbor still remained. I mean, remember Pearl Harbor was without a doubt one of the most common expressions throughout uh, that and I shall return uh, probably two of the most mm -hmm. common things and that was a, a huge propaganda slogan so yeah. round of applause for our panel thank you gentlemen thank you John John and James uh, they will all be out at the book signing retail station and also during this 30 minute break, uh, I'd recommend you go and check out our travel and conference table right outside the elevators so you can learn more about these great trips that John was trying to helpfully plug. We'll be back at 9.30 for our next session. Thank you. You good?